Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on the subject of my special order. Without objection. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, tonight I am convening a special order hour for the Congressional Progressive Caucus, and we are focused on the urgent matter of our children's mental health, which is in crisis. I want everyone listening to me now to think about their childhood. What stressors, if any, did you experience? What kept you up at night? What made your heart skip a beat or your palms sweaty? What seemed completely overwhelming? Now think of who was there to help you, listen to you and comfort you. Now imagine that stressor and imagine dealing with the same issue. In a time when a worldwide pandemic forced you to remain at home for more than a year before you returned to school with constantly fluctuating COVID policies. In a world where the book you read last year is banned in school now. In a world where you spend a significant amount of time on social media, consuming stories and pictures of other people's lives. And that includes coming across lies and disinformation. In a world where a former president wanted to build a wall, where death is ubiquitous, and where food, gas, and housing prices are so high, you often go without the basic necessities. In a world where the Supreme Court has stripped basic human rights that your parents and grandparents were able to enjoy, could you imagine being a child right now and juggling your mental health? Mental health is essential for overall health. And ignoring that basic fact is harmful to our children who are counting on us to do everything in our power to support them during this difficult time. This pandemic has exacerbated many pre-existing challenges, stressors and trauma experienced by our youth. And it has also caused many new challenges. In December 2021, U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murthy issued an advisory highlighting the urgent need to address the nation's youth mental health crises. Last fall, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and the Children's Hospital Association jointly declared a national state of emergency in children's mental health. Prior to coming to Congress, I had the privilege of serving New York City children in our public schools for over 20 years. I served as an elementary school teacher, a high school guidance counselor, and a middle school principal. The education, care, and well-being of our children are my life's work, and it is an honor to speak on the floor tonight to highlight an urgent issue that is critical to the health and safety of our children and the future of our democracy, our children's mental health. During the 2017-2018 school year, 34 children died within the K-12 school system in the Bronx, and 17 died via suicide. In early 2018, the horrible Parkland High School shooting happened, killing 17 children and wounding 17 more, while leaving a nation reeling in despair. During this time, as a middle school principal, I saw a rise in student self-harm and suicidal ideation in kids as young as 11 years old. It was these factors that ultimately led me to run for Congress in the first place. Since the pandemic, an unprecedented number of our young people feel helpless and hopeless right now, and we need to make an unprecedented effort for a coordinated, comprehensive response. That's why at the end of last year, we called for a new COVID relief package that considers the needs of the whole child to support overall health, including youth mental health. The toll of the pandemic is daunting when we consider its impact on children. In the past two years, more than 167,000 children across the country have lost a parent or primary caregiver to COVID-19. These caregivers provided a, a child's most important basic needs, love, security, food, and shelter. More than 13,000 of these children lost their only caregiver. In fact, for every four COVID-19 deaths, one child in the U.S. 
loses a parent. A student in my district in Yonkers shared her experience of suddenly losing her father to COVID, followed by her mother testing positive. She described her fear and not being able to sleep while her mother was in an induced coma for nine days. She couldn't eat, she couldn't go to school. Because of her father's immigration status, he was excluded from almost all types of medical insurance and was forced to choose between basic health care and food. Her story is not the only one like this, which is why we need to drive resources so that schools can directly support students' mental health and so we can break down barriers to basic, necessary health care for all, regardless of immigration status. After experiencing the major traumatic loss of a parent, we know the world as these children knew it has ended. Loss and grief are a part of life, but in children, grieving a major loss can have lifelong impacts of depression, post-traumatic stress, and anxiety. For parents and those of us who work directly with children, it is heartbreaking to see one child grieving. With this vast number of grieving children, our entire community must be ready to empathize and mobilize the help they need to cope. In addition to the stress youth are under as a result of COVID-19 and this ongoing pandemic, they're also facing other mental health issues as they navigate puberty and being an adolescent. Youth across the country are battling substance abuse, eating and body image disorders, facing various forms of peer pressure, anxiety, and overall trying to learn how to manage their emotions and feelings during their formative years. This is a reality across racial and economic lines. Still, meaningful mental health care is out of reach for so many children. Native American or indigenous children are four and a half times as likely as white children to have lost a parent to COVID. Black children are almost two and a half times more likely than white children and Hispanic children are nearly twice as likely than white children to have lost a parent or caregiver. When we also consider the many families who face job losses, loss of insurance, financial hardships, and the lack of school-based mental health professionals, the barriers to youth mental health support are unacceptable. It is now my pleasure and my honor to yield as much time that is needed to the Honorable Ms. Bonnie Watson Coleman, representing New Jersey. Thank you very much uh, to my colleague for organizing this very important moment on the, on the floor of the House of Representatives to address what is a critical, urgent issue, crisis in our country right now. Madam Speaker, I rise today to draw attention to this public health crisis that our nation has yet to adequately address. Over the last 13 years, youth mental well-being has plummeted. The Surgeon General's office reported that between 2009 and 2019, the share of high school students reporting persistent sadness or hopelessness increased by 40%, while the share of those contemplating suicide increased by 36%. The COVID pandemic has only made this worse. The youth mental health crisis, in many ways, a pandemic of its own, has only worsened in recent years. While the president's COVID response has been significantly more effective than that of his predecessor, we cannot properly address COVID without addressing the mental health consequences of over two years of isolation, uncertainty, and historic amounts of death and suffering. Black and brown youth are among those hurting the most. In 2019, my emergency task force on black youth suicide and mental health found alarming increases in suicide rates among black youth, in part caused by racial disparities in access to care. And as of last year, that rate of increase is more than twice as high for black girls and black boys. In response to this, I introduced the Pursuing Equity in Mental Health Act, which would invest in our entire mental health care system. That means not just funding additional mental health research, but also establishing a stigma-shattering outreach program and building a larger, stronger, more culturally competent Mental, mental health care 
workforce. To fight America's youth mental health crisis, we must prioritize equity and do everything in our power to eliminate racial and gender-based mental health disparities. This is an important moment in our time in Congress. We have devastation, sadness, and incredibly devastating responses to sadness at a very young age. I did not know that a five-year-old could comprehend that the ending his or her life was an answer to the pain that he or she has been experiencing. But I know that it has happened because as a result of seeing those posts over and over and over and over again on Facebook and other platforms, that's what motivated me to pull together that emergency task force. And it has yielded such tremendous information that we need as a country to know, to know that we need to invest in all aspects of healthcare as it relates to the disparities that exist with access to mental health care as well as just health care in general. We must do better. We have so much to overcome. We can do better, and I look forward to my colleagues on both sides of the aisle and in both houses to work collaboratively to do better for this next generation. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you so much, Ms. Watson Coleman, for your leadership and for your voice in this important matter. Thank you so much. I want to talk briefly before yielding to Representative Carter from New Orleans. I want to speak briefly about the role of schools in addressing the issue of mental health. Our schools play an essential role in supporting positive mental health for our youth. In order to serve the whole child, we cannot limit our federal support to only academic outcomes. Children are much more likely to receive mental health services in the school than anywhere else. But the problem is that too few of our schools have enough mental health professionals on staff, including psychologists, social workers, and counselors. The ratio of students to school psychologists is roughly 1,400 to one. Just this year, I hosted a town hall with students in my district who shared how hard it was for them to meet with a counselor or a mental health professional at school. The students with more access to mental health resources went to schools in wealthier parts of my district. As a former principal, I know firsthand how important it is that schools have the resources to employ mental health professionals. More than 14 million students attend a school with police officers or school resource officers, but no counselors, nurses, psychologists, or social workers on staff. The way we allocate resources is a reflection of our priorities and our values, which is why I support unprecedented levels of funding that prioritizes the mental health of all our students by making sure they are, tra they are trained, culturally competent mental health professionals in every public school, including more black and brown mental health professionals. For the last two years, two and a half years, we've seen our schools at the front lines of responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. In many ways, we as a society have shifted how we think about what it means to care for our young people in the face of multiple public health crises. Together with our schools leading the way, we work to create a safety net for our children and prioritize the well-being of the whole child. These are the kinds of investments that can buffer children from chronic stress that can lead to adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. It should go without saying, our kids are so much more than any one test score or academic measure. Children are individuals who are members of their community and our schools should be subsequently funded and equipped as community hubs. Supporting our children's success is fundamentally intertwined with supporting the whole child in a well-coordinated ecosystem of wraparound services. It is now my honor to yield to the distinguished gentleman from New Orleans, Mr. Troy Carter. Thank you, Congressman Bowman, for organizing this hour to discuss such a critical, critical issue. So thank you for your leadership, brother. 
Um, Madam Speaker, today I rise in support of the opportunity to shine light on this critical issue of mental health. Our children are our most precious treasure. For many of us, there are a reason why. Why we work two jobs, why we go to school, why we try to over overcome personal challenges and become the best version of ourselves. And yet, our system is failing to help our dear children fight their own demons. For kindergartners to young adults, young people of all ages are struggling with mental health, and that then they're not being met with the services they need to be happy, to be healthy, and tragically to save their lives. It is truly a crisis, and like most crises we face, the situation is worse for some communities than are others. Certainly it's the case for communities of color. Here's a, here is a terrifying statistic. Black children under the age of 13 are twice as likely to die by suicide compared to their white peers. Twice as likely. Further, children who survive natural disasters, like many of my constituents in southeast Louisiana, are left with emotional scars that can impact them for their entire lives. A new study published by the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry found that the stress of experiencing a natural disaster during a pregnancy can substantially increase the risk of childhood depression and anxiety. It's clear that we're in a crisis and we must act to meet the moment. I'm so grateful that the Institute of Women and ethnic, study, ethnic studies at the University of New Orleans, at studies of New Orleans rather, has grant, been granted $400,000 from HHS for an initiative to help identify health and wellness policies that are stressful in improving black youth mental health and including suicide prevention. This year, Congress just passed the Bipartisan Safe, Safer Communities Act, which will help keep guns out of the hands of ind individuals who are in danger of potentially hurting themselves or others. But this historic bill also includes $500 million for school-based mental health services and millions more for certified community behavioral health clinics and mental health telehealth. This year, we also launched the 988 hotline, mental health crisis hotline and text line, where people can reach trained counselors in their time of need we must, we can, we will do more. We must make mental health service easy, accessible, and affordable to everyone, particularly our children. We must tear down the stigma and equalize mental health and physical health. It's okay to not be okay. Everyone needs, to su needs support in a different point in their lives. Everyone needs a little extra help sometimes. Everyone can feel a little down sometimes. Everyone has issues that they think are insurmountable. But guess what? With help, with treatment, help is there. And you can survive it. You've got to know that. Don't ever be afraid to ask for help. Don't ever be afraid to admit that you just don't feel right. Don't ever be afraid to admit that you don't fit in, that you feel different. Help is there. And we've all had moments where we needed help. You've got to know that you can survive and you will survive this. We must all be trained about the signs of mental health and health crises and look out for one another. Implementing many of these programs and supporting the mental health professionals who provide these services at a significant price tag. And from my perspective, it's essential. Any dollar that we spend, any money that we appropriate that saves a life, that gives individuals hope that we care and that resources are available are dollars well spent. We need to do more. We need to invest in programs and have staff that change and save lives. 
and we need to do it now. We need to continue to fight. Our children are worth it. When someone has high blood pressure, they exercise, they diet, they take a pill. If someone has diabetes, they exercise, they diet, they take a pill. They modify their lifestyles, and they're not ashamed to admit those things. Mental health is no different. There's nothing wrong with admitting that you may need help, because help is there for you. And we know empirically that the resources are there, and they make a difference. So we've got to get away from feeling like if we need help, that somehow, some way, that means something's wrong with me. Well, there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing more wrong with you than a person that has a headache who takes an aspirin. There's nothing more wrong with you than somebody that has high blood pressure and they take blood pressure medicine. We can fix it. You're not alone. It's important that you know. To anyone who's struggling, who has children or young people in their lives that are struggling, you're not alone. You will never be alone. Things will get better. Reach out. 988 is available to you 24-7. Experts are waiting to heed your call. Organizations are funded to help you. We are here to help you. You are not alone, and you can, and you will survive. I yield back. Thank you so much for your powerful words and your leadership, Representative Carter, and thank you for being here this evening. When we consider the toll of a nationwide youth mental health crisis, our mission must be to show love to our youth and to help our young people learn to love themselves their communities, and our planet. In the face of so many real-world challenges, like the climate crisis, the pandemic, and extreme inequality and discrimination, it is essential that children's learning priori prioritizes creativity, innovation, critical thinking, problem solving, communication, and collaboration, as these approaches all support the mental health and the overall development of our children. These are the 21st century learning skills that will empower and teach our students how to think, not what to think. When the purpose of an education is about fostering the value and ethic of lifelong learning as a fundamental pillar of democracy, it is abundantly clear that promoting positive mental health is fundamental to that work. But when we try to apply a business model to our schools and treat our students as commodities, making the necessary investments in mental health supports and social emotional learning gets sidelined in favor of a more simplistic bottom line that improperly fixates on the results of an annual assessment. We've subjected our public schools to this model for 20 years and it hasn't addressed inequity in our schools. It hasn't closed any gaps. What it has done is limit what gets taught and how it gets taught. It's prioritized doing well academically over developing the lifelong skills that you need, including your emotional health and well-being. It's made students feel that their chance to live a quality life with opportunities hinges on how they do on a singular exam. We have the opportunity to change this finally and do right by our students. The idea that our schools should be equipped to meet the holistic needs of their students is not one that should exist only in the time of a pandemic. And we cannot go back to our old ways of thinking about schools just in terms of narrowly defined academic performance. Even before the pandemic, rates of young people experiencing mental health issues were rising. Between 2007 and 2019, the percentage of adolescents reporting a major depressive episode increased by nearly 60%. And by 2019, mental health disorders had exceeded physical conditions as the most common cause of impairments and limitations amongst children. I saw the gaps in our health system up close. 
Schools are the most common place for children to access mental health services, but most schools do not meet recommended ratios for school psychologists, social workers, or counselors. Instead, even before the pandemic, we saw pediatricians, teachers, school leaders, and more stepping in to tr try to provide mental health services, despite many of them not feeling fully equipped to do so. The pandemic only exacerbated all of these issues and put further strain on the health system that was already not built to adequately support youth mental health. As COVID surged, emergency room visits for young people having a mental health crisis increased dramatically. Since 2019, ER visits for suspected suicide attempts rose 51% amongst girls ages 12 to 17. But high COVID hospitalization rates and later the surge of new variants combined with inadequate vaccination rates mean that we had and continue to have a shortage of hospital beds and emergency rooms to service young people having a mental health crisis. In an op-ed by a constituent of mine, Jonathan Slater, a child and adolescent psychologist, described children and teenagers at his hospital having to wait three to four days for an inpatient bed. The strain on hospital capacity caused by the ongoing pandemic means our ability to adequately treat all other physical and mental health is jeopardized. The more people get vaccinated and boosted, that means fewer people in the hospital and it means the 15 year old who lost her parent to COVID and hasn't experienced a normal school year since she was 12 can get access to the emergency mental health care that she needs. I want to express immense gratitude for the many people, teachers, school leaders, pediatricians, school bus drivers, emergency room physicians and staff who have stepped in to confront the youth mental health crisis head on. But we cannot address youth mental health without addressing issues we face in our broader healthcare system and without addressing workforce issues in mental health professions. As we continue to face compounding public health and mental health crises among our young people, we have to recognize that cultivating a better nation marked by healthy and happy young people who are equipped to engage critically and collaboratively with their communities and our democracy requires us to continue on a path of rethinking schools and their purpose and potential. We need federal investments and resources in our schools that reflect these priorities and that means the mental, putting the mental health and well-being of our students front and center as we move forward. It is now my honor, privilege, and pleasure to yield as much time as that is needed to Representative Rashida Tlaib of Michigan. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much to the ever amazing partner in good trouble uh, in Congressman uh, Bowman for hosting this special order hour on one of the most critical issues facing our nation, youth mental health. As a mother of two young boys, I know that there are few people that see this mental health crisis amongst our children quite like our teachers and our educators. They are on the front lines of it every single day and it is in no way an exaggeration to say America's teachers are the ones saving lives in the face of tidal wave of trauma and grief brought about by many crises impacting our young people today. From COVID-19 to schools turning into war zones, severe economic hardship, an education system that continues to be underfunded, for a number of issues that again our kids are dealing with, we are seeing that trauma is at the center of it. I know according to National Alliance on Mental Illness, 57.8% of Michiganders the age of 12, from the age of 12 to 17, have experienced depression, did not receive any care in the last year, and high school students with depression are more than two times more likely to drop out than their other peers. These are just a few of the compounding traumas impacting our young people today. These traumas have stolen our children's sense of safety and our children's support systems. So the fact that the rates of youth in mental health distress have skyrocketed should be surprised to no one, especially not anyone in this body. We have failed to address gun violence. We have failed to protect the basic human rights. We have failed to ensure that every child in the richest nation on earth has access to clean air, safe water, and healthy food that they need to grow and thrive. 
we have failed to truly address childhood poverty. Instead of investing in schools, combating poverty, and taking action on reducing violence, this body continues to double down on failed approaches. I know I continue to be asked in my community, what good is another 100 F-35s when our children go to sleep on empty stomachs? What is the point of spending more money on militarization of our community than any other country spends on defense than making sure that our children have safe drinking water and making sure that they're not exposed to lead and PFAS? And while our children are crying out for help as loud as they can, over in the Senate, their elected leaders, many of whom have been brought and paid for by the fossil fuel lobby, are working hard to, guess, you've guessed it, sell out their chances at a livable future and improve, and improve the lives of many of our future folks. In this body, this Congress isn't just failing to address this youth mental health crisis, it's turbocharging it. I know in my community, we have the most polluted zip code in the state of Michigan, 48217, where we see high rates of asthma when I go read to children in the third grade class during March Reading Month, I ask how many children here know what I do for a living. And they, you know, don't know usually, and I have to kind of give them a little civic uh, exam, and I tell them I'm trying to fight for clean air. And I ask them, how many of you have asthma or suffering from asthma? And a third of the class always raises their hand. And I told them it hurts to have an asthma attack, doesn't it? It's hard to breathe, doesn't it? Isn't it hard to breathe? And they shake their heads. Every day, we fail. We fail them by not taking action on climate action for a livable future. And please know this, our children cannot learn if they're hungry, but they also cannot learn if they're breathing dirty air, if they're being poisoned by lead-infested water. So we must take action. I know that we also have failed to really enact real meaningful gun control that our children can be proud of that our teachers can feel very much that it's meaningful and that it actually does keep them safe. Every day we have failed to enact bold reforms to re resurrect and protect our democracy and, and is a day closer to dooming our children to a fascist future where their rights are stripped from, from them. And I know for many, uh, this isn't new for our communities, but I know for many of the young people of color in my community, the LGBTQI, youth, our immigrant youth, our religious minorities, these failures have amplified by a horrifying pandemic of racism, bigotry, and hate that has exploded in our country. And make no mistake, the crisis of hate phasing in our country is 100% the result of continued political motivation that is literally a factor in pushing elected officials and social leaders and spewing out fear rather than trying to address the root causes of the issues our children are facing. I know the only solution here is fundamental overhaul of what we govern. We must put our children before corporations, people before profits, and community solidarity before hate and fear. And again, I cannot thank my colleague enough for his incredible leadership. You know, sometimes it's our lived experiences that we bring in this chamber that gives us the passion and inspiration to work hard, and I'm so honor to be able to serve with somebody that not only was a principal but is also as a father himself and understands and has been on the front line and seeing the lack of res lack of action on this body to our youth mental health crisis in our country with that I yield thank you so much Rashida for your voice and leadership on this issue it's good to see you good to be with you tonight we've heard from members who represent communities across the country the youth mental health crisis is a national crisis that requires an all-of-government response. Our children deserve nothing less. There were so many voices that contributed to these remarks this evening from my district, New York 16. I would love to recognize them at this moment. Making the necessary investments in our youth mental health will take, us, will take all of us at every level of government and in every community. I want to give a special shout out to constituents of mine who shared their priorities around youth mental health. Jonathan Lewis, a Scarsdale Village trustee, shared how important it is to understand the relationship between the mental health crisis and learning outcomes for our students, and not just in an academic sense, but also with respect to school climate and the importance of creating a learning environment that is safe from violence. Stephanie 
Marcus Sano from the Harris Project in Arsley highlighted how important it is that communities, youth, and all levels of government be in dialogue with each other about the intersection of mental health and substance use disorders, particularly as it relates to our youth. Ron Hartridge, an educator and advocate in the Bronx, expressed his deep concern regarding the impact that trauma and fear has on our children and how important it is to equip our schools to support students. Instead of prioritizing compliant behavior, which is so often used to justify and perpetuate the school to prison pipeline. Jonathan Alvarez from 914 United in Yonkers called for meaningful juvenile justice reform in the lower Hudson Valley. Daryl Taylor, a Tuckahoe Village trustee, wrote in about the toll of the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly on our youth who lost loved ones, parents, siblings, or friends, and the urgency we must have to reach out to our youth who may be feeling alone in their grief and hopelessness. Mary Graves, Mount Vernon's Democratic Chair, shared how important it is that we make mental health resources and supports available to the whole community and consider how there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach to mental health. Julie Corden from my district shared how troubling it is to learn that suicidal ideation and attempted suicides amongst children increased during the pandemic and that this will not go away on its own. We have to work on this together. I am so grateful to all of my constituents who care so deeply about our youth, both locally and nationally. The youth mental health crisis is a national crisis that requires an all of government response. Our children deserve nothing less. Madam Speaker, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you all so much.